when night falls and the city lights are shone bright, with the country entirely asleep, then the work of the journalist begins. Our imagination goes wild, dreaming, thinking, and searching for that unique story idea. Visualizing and translating these ideas into action brings the story to life. And, like the fizz in our wine glasses, the story bubbles, finding space as headlines on front pages in the print, broadcast electronically, and posted on new media across the globe. And when it catches the attention of the powers that be, they act speedily. Join my ABO panelist and I as we speak to weightier issues from all quarters of the professional ladder share our journalistic experiences and offer insight beyond what is reported all on one magazine platform the reporters round table every thursday at this time on gbc 24 the reporters round table all angles all sides Hello everyone and good to have you join us for another exciting, educative and informative time on your favorite program, The Reporters Roundtable, a show that brings you to speed on the latest happenings in Ghana and beyond our borders. And if you want a thorough understanding of issues reported on leading media outlets in Ghana, we are your credible source. Just as to offer insight beyond what is articulated by newsmakers printed in the dailies and broadcast electronically. My name is Rebecca Iwa. My beautiful fabric is by Akosombo Textiles Limited, bringing fabrics to life and creatively stitched by Atshrifia Wei. Right, let's watch this video and when we come back, we will dissect the matter of contention. Cotton is a major cash crop cultivated in most parts of the world, including Ghana. As a form of employment and livelihood, farmers, mostly in the three northern regions, engage in the production of the crop. For instance, while Ghana only managed to produce 36,000 metric tons of seed cotton in 2006 and 2007, Burkina Faso produced a colossal 700,000 metric tons. Textile industries consume up to 80% of what is produced. Unfortunately, in the case of Africa, exports of raw cotton are occasioned by an absence of any significant domestic textile industries to add value to cotton grown by numerous small farm holders and the need to earn foreign exchange. A few still operating in the industry now depend heavily on raw material imports and have to fend off competition from cheap imported textiles. The effect is that the booming textile industry in the past is now a pale shadow of itself. The textile industry in Ghana once employed about 25,000 workers. Most of these companies produce high-quality materials, designs and very good textile brands which sold so well on the local market as well as other markets in West Africa. 
wax prints produced by these companies were in high demand on the Ghanaian market because they are used in making traditional apparels like the kaba and other exquisite words. The industry contributed significantly to the country's gross domestic product. In recent times, the industry has gone through some difficult times, resulting in shutting down of the production lines of most of the companies. Some of the companies which are still operating are believed to be importing grey buffed and semi-finished bleached cloth for printing in Ghana. Causes of the collapse of the textile industry include the influx of textile products from other countries. These textiles are relatively cheaper compared to those produced in Ghana. When we talk about African as made in Ghana goods, I think the main problem you're having is the pirating. We're not asking them not to, but at least copying our designs and producing them cheaper. I think that's why the government has to do something about it. And number two, if our industries could be, you know, could be helped out with their customs, I mean, reducing their import duties on some of the products is going to go a long way. One, we have to patronize our goods from the offices. When you come to Ghana, we try to copy. And I think this should be a point for any government to come on. We should use our textiles. Something like GTP is one of the fantastic garments you could ever get. Their quality is good. We have fantastic colors. I mean, everything about it is very unique. So I don't see why we shouldn't portray our own fabrics and then end up portraying other people's um, style. It doesn't go that way, but I think the government should do something about it. If it can be a policy that every company in Ghana should use the African way, specifically made in Ghana goods, I think it's going to help us. I see a friend to maybe high target. I mean, we are your partners now. At the end, the same, like almost so designs. And the ones any panel banners will want to maybe design it to say GTP, a so barrier, and a fleece, and a something. So the price in the manner, or can you the same thing? Now, price no format. I was like, be a 75 or 80 cities. Or can you 40 cities and a 35 cities? Design here the same thing, but the quality now. Mostly, no, be a new in Panyan in him. How are they quality yet? But we are new to Mamma dear. As GT from bare fifty years in India. Do you mean GT? Mamma said GTP, GTP. With cheaply made Western clothes flooding the market, the local textile industry has been decimated. Some critics of the business say the sale of imported used clothes is edging out the local textile. <laughs> this is laughable, honestly. I'm sorry, we are not killing the Tezas business. We are not killing it. We are selling for the poor and the, and, and the honorable in the country. Presently, the country's remaining textile factories are fighting to survive the competition. The deluge of used clothing importation isn't just destroying jobs. It has also had a seismic effect on the Ghanaian tradition and culture. Well, then I think the Ghanaian textile industry should also do something about the textile they produce because it's very expensive. And then now when you buy it, when you go and sew it, to the industry, they take high prices. And we, we can't just afford, you, if you want to just sew a simple dress, you buy the textile for like 40 CDs, you go, the industry will take like 30 CDs, 70 CDs for just a dress. But you can use these same 70 cities and you can get like four or five dresses in town and the same quality. So if they want us to be buying their test, I think they should do something about the price for us and we'll stop using the money. I say, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. But I say, I'm going to go to the house. But I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go Friday has been set aside for all to wear made in Ghana fabrics to occasions to boost the local textile industry. But should this be the case? Not at all. 
It should be every day wear, every, for every occasion, for everything. How can you put on a dress on just on Friday? There's no need buying it. But you, if you have to use it for the whole week, you have to buy more, you have to portray it, and you can use it and use it well. So I think it should be every day wear. It shouldn't be Friday wear. To say seven days in a week, now because we've been here back in a... Nice, I can say this. To me, and Tosun. About five years, and you see every Friday, be here, and six years back. How many people? In Penny for no more, this I'm running by, and I say, whatever. Oko Parliament, because I was in the Paduson as African way. As a Friday, coot. And then, well, maybe. It's not bad, say, yeah, Shannon said Friday, go on. Friday, go on, we're advertising us, I was saying, oh, yeah, oh, Bobby, be who you are. One hour, one hour, one hour, two minutes, two minutes, and you say, Shani, that Monday, ever do Friday, Saturday, ni Sunday, dinner, a woman say, Shay, and your Friday pay. In Ghana and most West African countries, Western outfits are fast replacing iconic West African prints and traditional garb. This has become even worse in villages where tradition is held high. One can now find rural folk adorned in Western clothing. The African pride, tradition, and what Ghana's first president, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, calls the African personality, is diminishing gradually. It is high time our textile industries are revamped for the total good. Indeed, the foreign cast offs have come to help, but that should not take our Africanness away. Our identity as true Africans must be re-echoed because a nation without its culture and tradition, they say, has no identity. <laughs> Ephraim Amu stood alone most of the time against what he saw as cultural domination. You did not have to wear a European cut suit to be a scholar. You could wear a fugu kente and above all, a locally woven fabric and still be an educated person, he argued. He insisted you did not have to eat foreign foods because you were a scholar and he insisted our music was as interesting and sophisticated as any around the world. Those were radical ideas for the time. Yeah, welcome back to the Reporters Roundtable. I guess by now you have a fair idea of what we are heading towards. Yes, we are adding our voice to that of other stakeholders to increase awareness among the public on the need to patronize made in Ghana goods and services. There is this false perception that locally made goods are inferior, hence preferential taste for foreign varieties. We will attempt to erode that perception. This time round, our focus is on the textile and garment industry. And in here to help us appreciate the topic is Madame Jifa Gomashi. She's a veteran actress, queen mother, and former deputy minister of tourism, culture, and creative arts. Mr. Abraham Kumsen is the secret or general secretary of the Textiles Workers Union. And Reverend Dr. Joyce Rosalind Ayi. Dr. Ayi is a former chief executive officer of the Ghana Chamber of Mines and the first woman to head an African Chamber of Mines. She is an accomplished management and communication consultant and currently the executive director of Salt and Light Ministries. Also with us in the studio is Mr. Paul Adom. He is the sales and distribution coordinator for Akusumbu Testers Limited. Now you can follow us on Twitter at Roundtable GH, Instagram or Facebook and share your, your point of view. Our SMS or WhatsApp line is active 0244-475-422 and our email is also active. Reporters Roundtable at gbcghana.com. Welcome. 
ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Good to have you. Yes, thank, thank you for Auntie having Joyce, us. Auntie Joyce, let me start with you. Why is there a need for us to even patronize Made in Ghana goods in the first place? You know, development is never done by foreigners for a country. Development is an activity that a people of a country undertake for their well-being at all levels. And so if we want to develop, then we need to promote those who produce goods and services in Ghana for Ghanaian taste and so on. And for me, that is so critical. You cannot say that uh, you want to eat gari, but you want to go and import the gari from Nigeria <laughs> and expect that your people who produce gari will be able to support the cassava industry, the farmers, and so on. So you need to, to use what you produce then that is why you that is how you give jobs you create a, you know a chain of activities down the line and so on and this is what other countries are doing you see they want to come and sell their products to you and you don't want to patronize your own products it means that your development is going to be skewed right but Angela, why is there a um the situation where we find that uh, we do not patronize made in ghana goods that much what accounts for the low patronage? At the risk of sta sounding like a broken record, I'll still say it anyway. I think it's just the unfettered appreciation for other people's way of life that makes us think that everything we have is inferior and everything else is perfect. And it's a mindset, really. Um, I don't know how we got here, but I know how we can get out of it, mm -hmm. which is why I'm here. Um, to join you in, in asking that we take a step back and look at what we are doing to our country by the choices that we make on a daily basis. So w what is your solution? My or solution to is... To the interest of Ghanaians, and especially the youth, mm -hmm. so that they can have confidence mm -hmm. in made in Ghana goods. I, I think that it, it, you, uh, my, I should put my mouth where my money is and vice versa. Um, it's for me to, as I talk about it, to live it. And, and that's the example that I saw. I, I, I grew up um, under the feet of um, Ifwa Sutherland of Blessed Memory, Auntie Joyce, Mrs. Rawlings. Um, uh, and all they did, these fine, intelligent women, all they did was promote who they are, I mean, through and through. And so I think that it, it, it is in, it wanted to be like them. It shouldn't only be that they have beautiful jewelry and I want it or they speak good English and I want it. It must be everything. If you have role models who you believe in, you must emulate what they do. So I'm hoping that in, in living that, um, young people also see that there really isn't anything wrong with it. If you look at these women that I mentioned, they are beautiful, they are intelligent. What makes you think that your choices are better than theirs? They've seen it all, they've done it all. So I think that it's in, it's in supporting um, young people's businesses um, in, in the art and craft sector. It's in uh, promoting it wherever you find. And it, it, it shouldn't, you know, I've, I've decided that um, any young person who is doing anything brilliant in this sector, I'm going to support them. In the past, as an actress, I would have been paid to be doing it. But it's my, it's my, it's my contribution to what they are doing. It's letting them know I believe in you and I support you. And so... I go to an event and there are um, young people selling things made in Ghana. I take it and I said, I want to pose for, uh, with it for you. And if you go to my, my Facebook page, you see that I'm promoting a lot of people who work there. So those are the kinds of things that I do to support them. Right. But there's this question that begs for an answer. Let me throw it at your feet. Who really is a Ghanaian or what makes <laughs> one a Ghanaian? Um... I think that uh, culture is a people's way of life. And so a Ghanaian is somebody first who appreciates his or her, her Ghanaianness. And what does it mean? How do Ghanaians dress? How do Ghana what do Ghanaians eat? You know, what are the values Ghanaians espouse? And these are very important things. And so you find that you know, a lot of times I tell people, if you really want to see elegance, look at royalty. Yeah. 
look at our chiefs, look at our queen mothers. They don't always wear kente, but they have others, but they are always dressed in Ghanaian things. And, uh, and they wear beads, they wear, you know, gold jewelry, they wear cloth, and they wear slippers, you know. That is what identifies them as royalty. Now, a Ghanaian woman, I think, when I was growing up, what I saw from my mother was that even though she was a public servant, she always went to work wearing cloth. That's what my mother did. And so I grew up recognizing that wearing cloth was not just for one hour one crew school, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that you, you, you would be educated, but you would make a choice to be Ghanaian enough to wear local fabric to work. And so a Ghanaian is one who understands that being a Ghanaian has to do with how you dress, what you eat, the values you espouse is very important. And our values have to do with respect, with hard work, with um, a community sense, a sense of community. You know, we think that we are so tribal, but it's not true. There's a sense of community, and then there's a respect for other people, no matter how different we are. Of course, everybody says something nasty about the other person. But in real terms, Ghanaians are people who know that somebody comes from another part of the country, and we try and imbibe what they have. And, and we, we are, uh, you know, we, we go along. But the, the sense of hard work also, the sense of appreciation for uh, locally made things. I mean, see how Kente has evolved. See how Kente has evolved. See how the woven cloth for men has also evolved. It, 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 it is so important for that industry because it means the those who are creative are finding a lot of means. There will be artists, there will be those who will be doing the yarns, there will be those who will be stitching it together, and so on. It's a whole industry. I mean, if you look at uh, the way our president, the cloth our president put on, you know, the designs stood for something. Each design in the, in the cloth stood for something that is traditional, that is Ghanaian. And those who could interpret it, you know, could interpret it. And next time you see that even though nobody may uh, mimic it exactly, that kind of fabric is going to go round and it's going to also increase the industry and so on. So we must have a sense of pride in who we are. You know, we are great people. And you don't have any people who don't have any way of life. Everybody, whether we are wearing raffia, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whether we are wearing raffia or not, every group of people have a way of life from the way they dress through the way they eat, through the no, uh, mores and, uh, and norms that they have. Right, Mr. Adam. Let me come. What, what makes you a Ghanaian? Um, you know, um, a Ghanaian. Being a Ghanaian, the emphasis should be on the culture. I would say it's a cultural thing. Because in the culture, you have certain values, certain aspirations. And as Ghanaians, all individuals, all Ghanaians must aspire. That's why we have so many, you know, um, tribes in this country they all have their certain cultural values and that's why there's no way one com can compare cultures oh this culture is beautiful that culture is not beautiful because the value system in each culture represents something that is solid and that identifies you know with the individual or a group of people so you can boldly stand out and say that i am this or i am that and i think that is what is lacking in our you know contemporary uh, what i would say life because we are trying to mimic whatever is not ours and so by so doing we pick cultures from other 
people that there's nothing wrong when you pay cultures but when you make that culture your own to the extent that you look down on your own culture that's where i think we have the problem so a Ghanaian is a cultural thing and we must all aspire to uh, you know identify ourselves with that culture you know our kids some of us don't even speak our local dialects in our hopes you know it's a cultural thing and the value system in the culture makes you what you are when you mix that mark you become you know something else a so yeah a hybrid <laughs> that's why some of us cannot find our bearings very well but if you look at our language if you look at our tradition if you are looking at our culture even the dress that we wear the cloth that we wear the symbols that you find them in them always speaks of especially people especially people when somebody puts on cloth you can tell whether he is a, a Togolese or a Ghanaian or a Nigerian. You know that the way the person has dressed is a Ghanaian or he's a Nigerian. So it gives you that identity. Sometimes you travel outside and then people ask you, your intonation, the way you speak or the way you have dressed, are you a Ghanaian? Are you from West Africa? And so it gives you a, an identity. But you know, the people who come to stay here, the foreigners, they appreciate their culture. And sometimes I'm at a loss as to why some of us we fail to appreciate what we have. In the name of modernity and globalization, mm -hmm. Madam Gomashin, it's been a Ghanaian all about culture. Um, that and more. I think constitutionally also, if you're born in this country, or if your parents are from here, then you're a Ghanaian. And if you look at our life cycle, the way in which we celebrate our life cycle reinforces the fact that you're a Ghanaian that I'm born on a Tuesday, and so I'm called Abla. Mm -hmm. That makes me a Ghanaian. No, it, it's not in many places that a boy born on Wednesday is called Koku. It's because of the fact that you're a Ghanaian. So th there, are, there are nuances. There are uh, different things that make you a Ghanaian. Uh, birth by parents, uh, nationality, um, the constitution confers that on you. And then the cultural values, as uh, Auntie Joyce and uh, Mr. Adom. Uh, Adom have said, all of these things identify you as a Ghanaian. Um, of course, we have, we have some things that, you, that are unique to all of us as Ghanaians. And then there are some things that are specific to certain areas. As in the South, um, a lot of us wear carbine slates the way we do. In the North, the women will put the cloth around their, their, their bust. So there are certain things that identify as, as um, either, either ever or fanti, if you have a tekua, mm -hmm. um, or if you, are, if you are from, uh, if you are chief from the northern part of Ghana, it's a smoke, it's, it's not a stool, it's a skin. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have some things that identify us as a people. And you can't find that in any other place. That's what makes us unique. That's what we bring to the table of uh, UNESCO, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, of the United <laughs> Nations. Mm -hmm. that, that identity that you can find only in Ghana is what makes us Ghanaians. Mm. And that I like to eat a wok and for No! Rather than a wok plant. Uh, uh, mm. is a wok plant. <laughs> is a wok plant, depending on uh, whether you use a Actually, yeah. for, for <laughs> us as a Akla is just all of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. then we have a wok plant, yes. a mok plant, Agbali Mokpla. Agbali Mokpla. I like the Mokpla also. Uh, but if you don't eat it fast, it gets hard. It gets hard, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Let me come to you, Mr. Kumsen. How, how do we ensure that as a people, we are not carbon copies of other nations? I think it's affordability also, also <laughs> comes in. Because Kenti cloth, you know how much it costs. If you go to the market there, you can buy suit that is coat with the trousers, even three piece. If you have some fifty Ghana cities, eh. you can afford it. Oh. Mm -hmm. You can afford to buy that. Well, yes. Bend down. You see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is also, you know, a critical issue that is what the person can, you know, afford to buy with what he, he has, the money that he has, and so. This culture, tradition, and all these things, they are all about, about money. So if I go to the false line and I, I can get, you know, some slate and kaba, you know, 20 Ghana cities Christ, I think it's too much. Even 10 cities, you can get 
something and put it on. You may look European, but that is what you can afford. So all that we are saying has to do with the capacity of the people to, to, to purchase what we are talking about. Mm. For instance, if GTP one piece costs 240 Ghana cities, 2.4 million. And I can go to the market and get the same food piece for 100 Ghana cities. I'll go in for that. Mm. You see, whether it is African design or whatever, that's not what the person is looking for, the ordinary person. You see, if we're talking about classes, there are some, you belong to a class that you can afford to, to purchase Holland made things and all that. But the majority of the people don't have the means to, to you know, purchase some of these things that we are you know, talking, talking about. about. But what, what accounts for the high cost of um, the, f the fabrics or the, the, the cloths? Yeah, it's, it's because of the cost of production. Recently, you know, this at 60 Design, for instance, it was given to ATL and I think GTP print to Printex Print 2. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the market, ATL 1 is selling at 240 Ghana cities per piece. 12 mm -hmm. yards. 12 yards. Mm -hmm. Chinese people have brought some. It's half of this price, 120. The it's in the market. 60 years on the fabric. Yes. I see. 120. I see. So uh, how do I go in to go and buy it? Because it is made in Ghana by ATR. If I purchase, I'm helping the company to. It, it doesn't work like that. If I go to the market and see the same design at 60 design mm -hmm. being sold at 120 as against eight years 240. The quality may be different, but after all, how, how frequent am I going to use that? Mm -hmm. I'll buy it and manage it. Make sure that I don't use very fast or strong very, very soap. strong soap to wash it. You see, so the ATR one will be there, nobody will buy. GTP one will be there, nobody will buy because of the, of the price. So what we think should be done is that government must look at creating a congenial environment for production of you know, reasonable uh, costs mm -hmm. <laughs> things. Mm -hmm. Because if people are bringing this Chinese thing, they don't even use our entry points, the approved entry points. Tema Habo, Takwari Habo, no. Even Aflao, they don't even come through the checkpoints <laughs> where Customs people will, 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 will deal with them. They will pass through the bushes. We have been going around the, the borders to monitor, but it's even very risky to, to do that work. And they bring them almost every day. They evade taxes. So they get to the market and they will sell them at a price that that is ridiculous. I mean, you cannot believe it. Mm. That is one, one, one aspect of it. They even also copy our designs to deceive the customer. Because this, for instance, mm -hmm. is, is they claim it is GTP. It is not. This is not GTP design. If the cameras can zoom on it, we'll, we'll appreciate it. It is not, it is not GTP mm -hmm. made. But they have mm -hmm. even, you, they are using their uh, labels and uh, trademarks and all that. Mm -hmm. they, are, they, they are in the market. You see, so that's the problem that we have. So but how I'm do we identify as consumers? How do we n differentiate between the real GTP and, let's say, ATL um, cloth and these imitated brands? Becky, if you go to the market, you see this GTP. They call it Nketua, GTP Nketua. Mm. The, the original GTP will be, you know, uh, no, no, no. The original GTP will be displayed for you to see. Mm -hmm. When they call the price, oh, this is too expensive. And they will tell you that, oh, we have some, the same GTP and Ketua, which is half the price of this one. Mm -hmm. They claim it is, it is the same GTP, but they have the small one, which sells cheaper. And you, you prefer to buy that. If, if I go there and I see that, I will buy that one because it's cheaper. So what, what should be done to, you know, encourage this cultural thing? That's all. If culture is too expensive for me, I won't go in at all. I'll go to the first 
line and go and buy something that that will cover my my my, my nakedness. That's all. <laughs> that's all that the people want. <laughs> so when we are talking about culture, 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 <laughs> it is very very expensive to 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 you know I go. I so I'd like to chip in. I'd like okay. to chip in. I I think that there's a reality everywhere that there's competition. You know, and people will go in for uh, goods that are within their means. Mm -hmm. So I think as a nation, it is obvious that local fabrics are in, I mean, people, there's a high demand for people to wear local fabrics. In fact, it gives me so much joy to see young people now doing great things. You know, mm -hmm. somebody will be wearing a pair of jeans mm -hmm. and the top will be even like a kaba. Mm. And, the, you know, it's very beautiful, you know. So since there's a great demand, I think that, as Mr. Kumsen was saying, we really need to seriously consider the cost of production yeah. because there's a demand for our local fabrics. So what is the cost of production? Now, how do we compete with China? Mm -hmm. How do we compete with China? It has to do first with the cost of equipment, the cost of other things like uh, dye, the cost of uh, cotton yarns and gray bath mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Starch, like you know, tax, starch yes. and so on. Now, if we know that all these things can be managed even at two thirds of the price of what comes from China, then you can actually produce a lot mm -hmm. and make it so available that uh, the competition will be minimized. Because honestly, as Mr. Kumsen is saying, even for those of us you think are high class, <laughs> you think <laughs> are high class, Perception. yes, you think are high class, it's not always easy to go and buy, no. you know, and it's not only uh, 12 yards, that's 240. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the six yards that is 240 mm. or above, mm. you know. So even for us, we also would like to buy at a cheaper price. Absolutely. But we have to make sure that we used to have a, a, a cotton industry. Mm -hmm. Can we revive it? Shouldn't we revive it? Mm -hmm. We should. We used to have a factory that turned the cotton into yarns and base material for the industry. Shouldn't we revive it? We should revive it. It's a matter of course. It is not even an option. We should. But is it not about time also that we also developed some dyes? We have a lot of uh, chemical engineers. We have a lot of people who've done biochemistry, people who really know how to mix dyes as so should we not be mixing dyes, producing dyes locally? Mm -hmm. Must we always, you know, depend on dyes from abroad mm -hmm. and so on? What about the equipment? I don't mind if we go and import the equipment, but it has to be top notch equipment whose production is super. You don't want the kind of equipment that breaks down e every two hours, you know, and then there's a cost of power that goes on with it. So I think we should look at the various aspects of the production line and see where we can exponentially make a difference to really bring down the cost of production. Because honestly, Ghanaians look so elegant. In our fabrics. In our clothes. Right. So we'll go for a very quick break. And when we come back, I would go to Mr. Adum to find out the, the state of, let's say, for instance, um, Akosombo Testers Limited. What is happening now so that we can actually address uh, the matter? <laughs> it is a reporter's roundtable. You can get interactive with us on 0244475422. We are back. Stay with us. And get in touch with some of the best brains in the field of journalism. It's a good program. All the best.
My name is Rebecca Ewa. Keep watching the report is round table on GBC 24 this and every other Thursday. Okay, it is the Reporters' Roundtable. We are tackling the issues from all angles and from all sides. And we are still in the mood of Ghana at 60. Ghana 60 Ghana years 60 on. Years yes, on. yes, I know and Joyce is here. <laughs> and uh, the former <laughs> Deputy Tourism Minister is here as well, <laughs> correct? <laughs> yeah, Ghana 60 years on. Right, Ms. Adam, let, let's talk about the current state of uh, the textile industry. Particularly, you, you are with ATO, so let's focus on ATO. As an example, yeah, I would say, um, you know, let me begin with all the testers industries. Uh, there used to be many testers industries in Ghana in the 70s and then even in the 80s. But as I'm talking, we are left with only three tester factories in Ghana. Uh -huh. We have GTP, you know, and then printers and then ATL. Yeah. In the good years of ATL, the maximum employee of TIC was almost around 4,000. As I'm talking, we are about a thousand plus, mm -hmm. below, below ten, uh, or below ten. a, a, a thousand, mm -hmm. and so um, it's just like the normal process. Uh, ATL is still around. All the tester companies are around, but they are not healthy. Mm -hmm. The issue is that why are they not uh, healthy? You know, sometimes people tend to blame. Uh, my only problem with the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, concept is the way they copy designs, they copy logos and then they do all sorts of things without, you know, coming out of their own, you know, designs. We are not afraid of competition. We are here, we pay taxes from A to Z. Somebody will just enter China, pick your design, copy it, and then bring it through, you know, the porous bodies, and then duties are not paid. But if you come to our companies, customer offices are there. We are audited every now and then. We pay huge taxes. Our argument is that if these people are also paying taxes on a level playing ground, we will be in the position to compete effectively. You pay a VAT. Let me take a VAT. A VAT is not part of our margins. It is, you know, a tax for the government. But it is added to whatever price we are giving to the consumer. This is a situation where somebody gets into, you know, import, you know, through the porous bodies, he doesn't pay anything. That's why they are able to sell. If my product is, let's say, 20 cities, he will sell at uh, 10 cities. Then apart from that, it's a policy. That's why I think that, you know, governments also can assist. We are all in Ghana when uh, the, uh, President Kufu introduced Friday Way. And let me tell you, this Friday Way has sustained all the textile companies. Wow. What is a Friday Way? Educational institutions will come and print their cloth. Year groups will come, there's a funeral, they will come, churches. churches will come, and then what have you? So, almost every institution in this country has something they call Friday Way that is a Ghanaian identity. Mm. And this has, one way or the other, supported you know uh, the textiles industry. Other than that, a lot of them, I think we won't have any textile industry in Ghana. And I think if care is not taken, a time will come, these companies we are talking about big gtp big atl big printers will also you know follow the suit we will go to china print and then come back for example we have a facility at the factory that you know for now atl is the only, only company that process lent cotton the raw cotton from the farm mm -hmm. we have machines that will convert that thing into a weaving department before the gray cloth comes out and then it is printed on it it is a vertical integrated raw cotton it is spin and then yarn. The yarn is woven, and then you just print your fabrics on it, and then you pack it for the market. All the companies in Ghana, it is as at now, only eight years that has sustained that vertical integration. Mm. Others will just get the gray and then print on them. Or maybe 50-50, you get your gray from China, and then you do a portion here because of the cost. Now look at energy costs. You look at energy costs, you pay so much for energy cost, you pay all the taxes, and then all these things doesn't help us to compete. If we have a level playing field, we are all competing. Nobody will complain. If we are paying the tax, the people who bring them illegally should also pay the tax. If they pay the tax, how do you get an illegal fine? person? <laughs> as, as Mr. Kumson was saying, institutions. yes, as Mr. Kumson was saying, <laughs> if they uh, uh, don't even come through the uh, routes, 
where they will be taxed. And if we, the same Ghanaians, will be the ones up, up in arms. No, when they decided to go to the markets to confiscate, we are the same Ghanaians who rose up in arms and said the government is destroying other people's business. I think that the thing about business is that you should know that the competition is there all the time. I, uh, I lived for a very short while in a, a town in Germany that was big on the textile industry. They used to make shirts and so on and so forth. And they were hit big with competition when it became cheaper to go and print everything in China. Mm. And so that huge factory became defunct. And it affected that town very badly. Of course, later on, they decided that the focus was not going to be in the tech, on the textile industry, but they were going to find ways and means of you know, promoting um, more integrated activities for the economy. Mm -hmm. So I think that if ATL has, uh, let's say, this whole integrated from cotton to yarn, mm -hmm. that is an advantage. Wouldn't you sell some of the yarn, mm -hmm. some, some of the gray baft? Should you not make that also one of your key things so that you will sell some of the gray baft to another company? That is something to think about. Yeah. Make more gray baft and sell it to a GTP or something. Of course, the price must be competitive. Mm -hmm. You See, know, the, the issue is this. Mm -hmm. Let me chip in. Um, if you import a gray from China with taxes paid, it's just close to one dollar. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, when you buy cotton at wear market price in Ghana here, and then you process them, your cost is about two point fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. so if you want to even make that place your core, that area your core, how will you sell to somebody who is in here, and then? You see, one thing about textile company is that, uh, you see, probably we may not be making profit or margins, but it takes a lot of people. Yeah. At a capacity, ATL can take about 4,000 people. Mm. At a capacity, GTP can take equally around the same. So within the industry alone, even just three industries, you have about 4,000 or 8,000 people. And we promise our people that, oh, we will give you jobs, we need to work, and then people become useless when they don't have jobs. People even lose their wives when they don't have jobs. And a whole lot of problems, they can't take care of their kids. And, and so I will consider it to be as a priority area and with a support mm -hmm. of a government. Not that it's a free money, just go and spend a private investor, government is supporting you. But there's a payback time, and then our people can get something to do. And then we can also compete easily. That is the whole uh, issue of this uh, textiles industry. Because now by and by, in the 1970s, the textile industry takes uh, about two point something million people who were working mm. in there, mm. and now you can count them less than two thousand. But so inef inefficiencies also, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. government should definitely support. But I think one of the things that we must all do is also improve our efficiencies. Yeah. The efficiencies is very, very, very important. I do agree that the conditions to make you competitive. Is a burden of government but i think that the responsibility to also be efficient is something that we should all carry and part of the efficiency is also the the amount you can produce you see if we were producing enough those who go and bring them would have no market you, I guess yes. it's because of the, the, the challenges yes that's what i'm saying at, at, going to china mm. I, is Ghanaians who take GTP and ATL? Yes. ATL yes. Yeah, they are work. not the Chinese and so. Yeah. Who take it there to be done? I, I was about coming to and, that because mm, the designs mm. and the the logos and all yeah. that that you've talked yes. about. Have you been able to even track it and um, file a legal suit or something so that it can? Because there's somebody within who yeah. might be doing that. Yeah. As no, you see, right, it, you it's right not very easy, that. as you were saying. Mm. For us, as an investor who has chosen to go to the textile sector. My core business is to produce textiles. Some years back, these companies even operated transport that bring their uh, workers 
they had the security department and all that, canteen and all that. But they realized that, look, our core business is to produce coffee. I'm not a transport manager, I'm not an engineer. So they have to outsource, outsource the canteen, the transport, the security, so that they can concentrate on their core cough production. Now, all that we are saying is that create, give us a, 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 a fair playing field. Playing field. Mm -hmm. Let this people, like he's saying, if we add the VAT onto the cost of the cloth that we have produced here, meanwhile, the Chinese man is bringing this thing here without any such. You know, so certainly, I think that we, 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 we like to call the Chinese a bad name all the time. Mm -hmm. But Ghanaians are the ones doing this, not the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Chinese mm -hmm. The Chinese is there, you bring it's, the business. What about right. yes. mm -hmm. yeah. Look, we the went to court. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. DTP went to court with some uh, traders about two, three years in court. The, chi the local businessman who spent three years spending money pursuing this person in court. Finally, what the judge said was that, oh, let's give the trader the benefit of doubt. Uh, he didn't know that uh, <laughs> this thing uh, is, a, is, a, is, is an offense, that sort of thing. So three years, you have wasted money. No, he, he, so litigating on this mm. thing. In the end, the judge himself felt that, oh, it, benefit of doubt. Ignorance is no excuse. So if you are saying that, it means that the, the judicial system itself must be prepared in a way that they will understand the challenges of the local manufacturers. Otherwise, look, GTMC, for instance, TTL. I was employed in the industry 71, 6 October 1971. We're running three shifts. You don't even, even, even rest. That was the time. Go to TTL and see. You have videoed the place. You will see, you will weep. But the work ethics at that time, that's what Auntie Joyce mm. was saying. The work ethics in your time where you had the, the shift system, it's not the same as mm. now. You see, we, I think that this matter is a has a hydra-headed mm. um, problems. And in the, in the same way, we, we ha it must have a hydra-headed way of being solved. Mm -hmm. So it's it's about the, the, the workers of the industry, the governments, and of course the citizens of Ghana yes. who should change all of us. Yes. By that singular act of selfishness, where because you want maximum profit, and I, I think that, that that is not about maximum profit. I think the policies that have been pursued by if I if no if I take if I take no, if I no 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 if I take this the work of uh, ATL to China to make it cheaper, it's a selfish decision mm -hmm. I've taken. That's mm -hmm. one individual who is selfish. But no, 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 no. You, you can't blame the the investor. Who has put money into that business what here in Ghana? Uh, what, it's somebody no. who and is so, no. a criminal. We have to look at it from all mm -hmm. the angles. Mm -hmm. We cannot just leave it at the doorstep of government and say, government needs to do A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. Yes, government has to do but in, citizens must be responsible to the state. Mm -hmm. Citizens I'm, what, ma, uh, must be accountable to the state in the decisions that they take on a daily basis. You see, what, what I'm saying is that all me, right. so, I, um, I, I'm manufacturing, please give me, I'm manufacturing crop here. I think that government or the authorities are not helping. So what do I do? Like he's saying, then we all go to China. If you go to GTMC TTL, they have converted the place into warehouses. They have rented them out to people. <coughs> and imagine that you're sitting in the house. You get this money all right. No employees. <laughs> and it's more profitable. OK, so uh, l l let's wrap up on this. Let, let, have to uh, have uh, finally, our final words time, on this. Time, Especially uh, when um, uh, Mr. Adam made mention of the fact that the introduction of the Friday were uh, has really helped their business. How can we um, promote it more? Okay. If Friday is not enough for us to look Ghanaian enough, how can we uh, intensify it or promote the days? So that maybe two or three days. Yeah, yeah finally. Yeah, that will be the final point on this subject. The Chinese so but, but again, it's the of how Mr. Kumsi, now come always, to you. you Let always, me start with Dante Joyce. How do you always, why do you have to legislate all the time? Mm. I think the campaign must be go beyond Justified. government yeah. legislators yes. mm -hmm. that there should be a Friday way. How Who do I, as a Ghanaian, yeah. support the, that industry? Absolutely. Shouldn't I feel that I should wear it more? Which comes back to costs and so on and so forth. So again, even in terms of 
design. Can I wear something, uh, uh, you know, use some two yards to do it and have more of it rather than always wearing six yards and so on. So again, those who are designers and so on should come up with several ways in which we can use the fabric and still look good, uh, you know, because government doesn't always have to legislate that that you, should, you must wear this mm -hmm. all the time yeah, one, you know agree. i yeah. i think the, the and i think that the industry must also continue its advocacy and help government to help them take the decisions that will help Great. yeah on the uh, on, on the employee side i think we all need um, attitudinal change of uh, the way we do things mm -hmm. you know ghana 60 years on we shouldn't behave the way we were behaving if the 60 years and above we should be more mature. We should do things the right way so that at least industries, I think it's everybody. We cannot, uh, we are not blaming the government. We can't blame the government always. And I think the second issue is also patriotism. We we're talking about Absolutely. culture, yeah. patriotism. I used to have a boss. Let me give this one example. When we are going to even buy pencil, he, will, he was a Chinese from Hong Kong. He will make sure that whatever he is buying is made in China. Mm -hmm. But when we are going to buy, what do we do? We want made in England, made in US. And then I ask him, boss, why? You say, anytime you buy anything, not from your country, you are putting money in the pocket yes. of that country, yeah. and your own people will become poor. Yeah. That's why, th that is what is happening. So if he will go around and then he doesn't get anything made in China, he will buy made in Ghana. He mm. will not buy anything American or anything. So I think it's an attitude. And for them, it is ingrained in them. They are taught from primary school. One instance from, home. From, from, home. from home. He was here working and then he said, Oh, Chinese government has issued some statement that if you have a child, not in China, but here, you should come back home and then learn their language. And the alphabet is over two thousand. He sent the kids who were at Ghana International School to China for two years or three years. You see the attitude not change that we have. The cultural thing. So it is ingrained from birth. And then parents are supported to do that for everybody. When we have that, then everybody will become very, very patriotic. And <coughs> if we do that, our industries will take, our schools will take, everything will start from there. And we should call children, children, not kids. Madame <laughs> Gomaji, <laughs> <laughs> finally, how, how do we erode the perception that made in Ghana goods are inferior? Well, if, if your products are inferior, are you by extension saying that you are inferior? Mm -hmm. You, the value you place on, on yourself is the value that you, you should place on everything that is from your culture. You cannot place value on yourself and, and downplay the value of the, the, the system within which you function. I don't see how that works. And so let's stop having all these excuses of uh, the finishing is not good and, um, <coughs> and it's more expensive. I, I think these are all, all excuses because the things that you buy from um, England or... Uh, America or wherever, they are also expensive, mm -hmm. and yet you buy them. So if you invest, if you invest in this country, the taxes will remain here, and the, we are, we are, we will all be the beneficiaries of the of, of the results. So I I, I think that um, I like to support Mr. Doom on the call for patriotism, and Auntie Joyce also reiterated that it, it is all about deciding that I'm doing this because it is good for my country. I'm doing this in saying to God that you did not make a mistake by having me um, born in, in, in Ghana. You did not make a mistake by choosing Aplau as my, my hometown. We, as mine. I, yeah. I <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think that it's in, it's in that acceptance of self and placing value on that divine choice that was made for you that will affect everything else that you do. Mm. As long as if you question that, you will question everything else. We must believe in this country. We must, we, must, we must be willing to die a little bit for this country. After all, in your 60 years on, we've had governments come and go. But the citizens are still here. The, the people who form the government are picked from amongst us. They're not coming from anywhere. It's all of us. So we, we, as we ask for legislation, we must ask ourselves also, what can I do? To make it better. Great. What can you do to make it better? In a minute. I think then the laws are already there. We don't even new, need any new law to enforce some of these things. All we are saying is that consistency. You know, some time passed, I know NPP, they said this cloth, we are high risk 
uh, materials and they put in place measures to deal with those who bring in these uh, fake ones. And I think that uh, we are going to continue engaging government to make sure that measures are put in place that will stop these uh, fake things that have come to destroy it. Our, our, our jobs. I think you should have Rain. a show that teaches us how we can identify the okay. fake from the original. Becky, right. then I'll arrange. I'm, I'm arrange really yeah, I, I will do really that. Shocked to see. <laughs> I'll do that and get back original. to you. <laughs> mm. Right. Mm -hmm. This has been the Reporters Roundtable. We, will wrap up, we are wrapping up on our first segment. We were talking about promoting made in Ghana goods and particularly revamping the textile industry. I have been in here with Reverend Dr. Joyce Ayin. She is the executive director, Salt and Light Ministries. Mr. Paul Adom is the sales and distribution coordinator of Akosombo Textiles Limited. And Madame Chifa Gomashi is a veteran actress and former deputy um, minister for the creative arts. And <laughs> Tourism. Tourism, culture, culture and creative arts. Tourism, and culture and Mr. Abraham Kumsen is the general secretary for the Textiles Work Union. Thank you all for joining us. We'll come back to the second segment and there you can also phone in and give us your submissions. Stay with us. We'll be back. Journalism is dynamic and as part of our responsibility, we are supposed to go out there, fish for information for the public. Today in Ghana, it is our duty to ensure that the masses know what is going on in society. Reporters round table viable place than the surrounding in Zimar towns to find markets for his wares. With time, he settled permanently at Halfa Sini. Tearful Nanai Zenu lamented how Nkrumah's heritage has been abandoned and pleaded with government to help the family restore and preserve them. The crew then moved to the coastal part of Halfa Sini and visited what remains the pathetic state of the facility referred to by the citizens of Halfa Sini as Nkrumah's bungalow. It is now abandoned in a forest and is rotten away. Originally painted white, years of neglect and vagaries of the weather have turned the color into something between yellow and brown. This facility is said to be a place where Dr. Nkrumah used to come and relax. A retired district cultural officer at the Jomoro district Mr. Francis Kwaja spoke more about the facility. This is a place where he comes to rest. In fact, I also meditate. Normally when he brings a helicopter, we have an airstrip here, just around this place. From there he will walk through this lane. And then, normally he doesn't pass here. He passes the other side. And people used to say that uh, Nkrumah has got an underground uh, building. It's not so. There's another outlet behind the building. When he comes, he likes natural things. We we'll bab the sea. There's another river at uh, just about five kilometers at Mitika. He used to go there from walk down early in the morning you can walk to that side and then back you sometimes go to bath the river and then at times he likes fresh fish no matter when he comes we have these elders or these young young boys they used to come and climb the coconut and you they will bring him some uh, we have a bathroom area here after bathroom you see this is where he will shower himself there's a bathroom there. There's also a balcony there. He will sit there to rest. Every bit thing that was owned by Kwame Nkrumah was stolen. And since then, the building has been left to rot. All that we want to tell the government is that we shouldn't let this building rot. It's, a, it's, it's an asset. And if we take good care of it, I mean, tourists can come here. That, look at how the way it has been got to us. I will rather plead to the government that uh, the whole structure could be, uh, I mean, take care of. We can restore everything and then bring it to life. It can be used even as a, a library or research place 
for students or for research people so that anytime they come, anybody come, and he wants anything about Kwame Nkrumah, they can come here and then they will get it. The news crew, curious to find out why such potential tourist attractions should be abandoned and left to rot, paid a visit to the Jomoro District Assembly and inquired from the Assistant Coordinating Director, Ms. Gifty Nkrumah Arthur, the Assembly's priorities, especially with reference to historical places such as Nkrumah's bungalow. As much as we want to do these things, we also don't want to uh, stray from the directive so that we'll be called to answer and all. So in our own small way, we've been soliciting for individual supports. We've been calling on NGOs. We've been calling on the natives who are well-to-do to come in and help. So I think uh, somewhere five years ago, I mean, we did some few innovations there uh, at the place where Kwame Kwame School that is, I, I think if you can testify, I don't know whether you've been there, you realize the place is quite better than you saw first. I don't know whether you were there before the renovation. But as a rep, like I said, of government, we are being given funds and then we are, we are being directed as to what to do and then we have to ensure that we go accordingly. The team also tried to find out the role the Assembly is playing in the preparations for Ghana's 60th anniversary. We are trying to uh, invite even the DC of Côte d'Ivoire to be part of the district's uh, celebration. We are also going on air. We've even started that, the various FM stations here, trying to bring out the fever of the independence into the people. So what we do every day is we get people there, they tell the history, then we have a phone in sections, people call and their concerns or questions are addressed accordingly. So these are some of the things we are doing to, I mean, man the day. The earlier Dr. Nkrumah's legacies are given a facelift, the better. For it is said that a nation that does not honor its heroes is not worth dying for. All right, this is a program proudly sponsored by Kosombo Testers Limited for our casting clothes. Get in touch with them. And for a gorgeous finishing, don't forget one name comes up at Yahweh. With, for this segment, uh, yeah, we just watch a video from, uh, is it in Law Floor? Yeah. Yes, in Law Floor. That is um, President Nkrumah, former president of Ghana and the first president of Ghana, Sergeant from Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's hometown. And um, in case you missed out on the very first segment, we were talking about, we threw more light on the textile industry. And I know you are still here and still in the spirit of Ghana at 60, or Ghana 60 years on, and in the heritage month, our culture and tradition is held high. And tourism is a way of telling or showcasing to the world who we are, where we have come from, and what we stand for. Following the discovery of oil in Ghana, um, it became one of the fastest growing economies in the world and foreign investments accelerated, bringing more business travelers to the country. And while growth has cooled, the medium term outlook looks solid, particularly given Ghana's political stability. And the business segment will remain central to the tourism industry. In here, I have Mr. Kofi Akpabli. He is a Ghanaian <laughs> academic. He's a journalist. He's um, a travel columnist, right? Yes, and he's a publisher and a tourism consultant and a cultural advocate and a two-time CNN multi-choice <coughs> Africa journalist for arts and culture and now a faculty member with the Central University College. Mr. Kwabli, you, you also won uh, the GG Awards three yes. times, right? For um, arts and culture. Yeah. Great. Right. In here is... William Esiedo. William Esiedo is also an award-winning Ghanaian journalist. He is also an art writer. He's also won uh, the GJ Award for Arts, Culture, and Tourism severally, right? Yes, and he is the uh, managing editor for Daily Heritage and the business manager of EIB Network. 
<laughs> I hope I, I, I got all the designations yeah, you, right. You did well. Right. We, we just watched a video from the town of um, former president Nkoma. You have been there. This is a site or where Nkoma used to live. And the building in its entirety has been abandoned. <laughs> but it's a cultural and heritage site. How do we preserve things of this sort and market it so that we can get value out of it? I mean, if somebody told me that exactly 10 years after that assignment, I'll be here on national TV talking about it, I wouldn't have believed it. I was there in 2007, Ghana at 50, to see how Ghana was preparing this heritage site for local tourists and, of course, international visitors. And what I saw there was put together for a story that won me the first uh, GJ Arts Award. That mm -hmm. also took me to the UK to work with the Voice newspaper. Wow. And that was a very proud moment. But of course, the, the, the details of the story still make me sad, especially 10 years on, and the, the situation hasn't really changed. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, bothers some of us as journalists. Because then it makes us look like just academicians or academics, just talking. You know, there's no action. There's no action. You know, there's no execution. So then it makes you ask yourself, why do you just sit on TV, take your pen? I've come here with some of my clippings. I'm just writ writing a lot of articles on some of the things that we are discussing. I got in Kofo and I was trying to get access to the facility. And I was told that the key was with the assemblyman who had traveled for some private business. And so we couldn't enter. So if I had come with a group of you know, visitors from, say, the UK or the US who were ready to pay money, that was what was happening at the time and it was in the story there was no attendance at the time regularly you know you know attending to the place to usher people in make money and there was just this little pool behind the the visitor center where Kwame Nkrumah was supposed to have been taking his bath and I was just ex excited about it <coughs> I got there and, and and the pool was dry because of silting dumping of refuse as usual so the issues that was I mean, the issues that were raised 10 years ago, I'm afraid to say, are the same today. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, the whole tourism development agenda is an issue of two things, attitude and execution. Negative attitude and lack of execution. For instance, if you appoint somebody as Minister of Tourism, what is the mandate of the minister? Do we journalists know? You know, because if you, if you meet a, a, a minister at a public function, you throw some questions at him or her, and obviously, you, the journalist, you don't know the mandates of the minister and, for that matter, the ministry. Mm -hmm. I believe strongly that every ministry in this country has a stake in the tourism development agenda. Because tourism runs on roads, it runs in rivers, it runs in, in the air, it runs in restaurants. And these are all areas that go under different ministries. So, the, for me, the core mandate of the minister of tourism should be to effectively coordinate the efforts of all these minist ministries, you know, to push the agenda. And of course, when that mandate is rightly established, we should task him or her to execute. But in this country, we just talk shop. We don't execute. I mean, that one is clear. If it comes to ideas, if you give me pen and paper, I will write a 20-page article on tourism. But put s somebody there to execute and to be. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that I think critically we should be running on, those two cylinders. Attitudinal change. And then, you know, calling people to, to order in terms of their, you know, poor attitude towards execution. Mm -hmm. Because, Phil, it is somebody's business to... I have a story here I would want to show you. Okay. Accra, a road that is the capital village of Ghana. That was the headline I gave. Accra, mm -hmm. the capital village of Ghana. You understand? And why did I write art that article? It was simply because we said we want to develop the city. And even at the point, there was a ministry in charge of the development of the capital city, if I, if I remember right. And what, what happened? <laughs> you know, you go, I mean, you were asking me about how to develop business sites. And I'm taking GBC. I'm not saying this to spite anybody. This is a frank point that we have to make. Growing up as a, as a son of a soldier, I knew how GBC was involved in the politics of this country. So if you talk about political tourism, GBC is key. Where a lot of the action took place here. My father and others had to crawl from here to points before they could walk home. I remember I was, I was expecting to come to GBC to see GBC in a certain light. So who has taken the trouble to make GBC a tourist site? Where 
you develop the place so much so that you go to BBC. Our president was at CNN, the former president. And he went to stand by the, the CNN logo and took a photo. It wasn't a drawing. It was a photo. Why did he do that? Because CNN has carried itself to a certain pedestal where our, a whole president of a, a country like Ghana wanted to take a photo by the CNN logo. So what is GBC doing? I'm not saying this to spite GBC. I entered GBC and I've been looking around. You go to the, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this so that we all take, you know, notes. You go to the powder room and you, 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 you look at the place. Is that how BBC, CNN, powder room would look? So we are talking about standards and tourism is about standards. If I go to Mauritius and I drink a, a glass of beer and the scent in the glass is pleasant, I expect to have that when I go to Seychelles or I come to Ghana. So these are standards that, you know, so tourism is about standards. And that's why I'm saying that execution is a problem. I think I'll end here. And then because the points will flow and you will uh, not uh, Yeah, yeah. The, the smart alone tells me he has a lot under his, uh, oh. his shelf to, to give out. Is that probably? Yeah, uh, the example you just gave is unfortunate um, because we know that Nkrumah, the gravitas he has is global. So one would think that uh, a place as connected to him as his home village would immediately be um, a mecca of a sort. Uh, but we, we can't just dwell on that. You look at it holistically. Uh, there are several other Ankrofus, there are several other heritage points across Ghana, uh, which have been, uh, to put it bluntly, neglected. Now, in tourism, you need to, first of all, develop the product. Okay. Uh, after developing the product, you need to maintain pretty much like any other business, manage it, and then market it. Um, so in, in looking at a place such as in Crofo, you can't even begin to talk about marketing. You understand? Because what happens is that you bring people to the site and what you achieve is nothing but an anticlimax. Okay, and daily Ghanaians are experiencing that because on one hand we are asking people to engage in domestic tourism, to step out there, to see Ghana. I just came back from a trip with CTFM across the country and it's a common refrain. People are excited, they eventually get to the place, they've heard the story and then something is missing they wish there was more. So this is just an example of how we have to do much more than we are doing for our attractions. Great. Reported round table it is. And uh, very soon we will be announcing, let me announce our, our, our phone number so that you can also um, get us on it. I can see people are sending in messages. We'll give you the chance so that you, you get interactive with us. But um, you can also uh, send in your messages and your, uh, your WhatsApp on 024 Four two two, and you can as well also call into the program when the phone lines are, are activated on zero five zero one five five two seven two nine zero five zero one five five two seven two nine. We are back from this break shortly. I'm Tudora Medeto. Join Becky and other colleague journalists on Reporters Roundtable this and every Thursday. Watch Reporters Roundtable and get in touch with some of the best brains in the field of journalism. It's a good program. All the best.
My name is Rebecca Ewa. Keep watching the report is round table on GBC 24 this and every other Thursday. Glad to have you stay with us and we are still on domestic tourism and we are, we are focusing particularly on preserving our heritage and cultural sites. And uh, in here I have Mr. Kofi Akpabli who is a tourism consultant and he's a man of many colors. William as well and I have been also joined in the studio by Alfred Hughes who is a broadcast journalist here in GBC. He was also in Inglaflo. That is a Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's hometown to um, take sounds and yeah, get some information from that town. So, uh, Mr. Kwabli, you were on a point. Who particularly, where lies the duty? Who holds that duty to actually locate these sites and to actually um, promote it and preserve it? Well, in our scheme of things, you have the ministry. Okay, the ministry drives the policy. So uh, for us, the policies include uh, tourism, tourism direction, uh, tourism assets, and those of the arts and culture as well. Um, under the ministry, of course, you have the tourism authority. You have the tourism development company, which is actually supposed to do uh, the private marketing bit. Um, so in the structure you also have the regional offices okay so they are more to oversee directly and on a daily basis and then of course uh, when you take an attraction there is the management committee okay so this is the structure now when you take how the place has to be managed on a daily basis that's definitely uh, localized okay those efforts are more localized but if the overall intention is to place Nkrofo way up there among the top attractions in Africa, for instance, then you are talking about a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. That is where the tourism authority comes in. And this should definitely be under the policy of the ministry. So with this example, you can see that uh, the, the oversight is spread across but the direction and the leadership stems straight from the top downwards. And, and over the years, has there uh, has a synergy brought about the, the outlook, the pleasant outlook that we, we desire to have in marketing? No, obviously uh, not. I mean, the, the evidence of the, on the ground doesn't support that kind of, uh, you know. Because in Laflo is just one, one example. Yes, that's what I'm saying that um, we've had occasions where Kofi and I, myself, and a graphic as a company and some other players have met the minister, you know, trying to put together this synergy, as you're saying. But the execution has always been a problem. And people think that everything is money. You know, people put money before them and then the money blocks them because they don't have it. But I'm saying that, look, we have ministers traveling all the time. We had a minister, uh, 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 an ambassador in India, who just went to talk the, to the, the Indian government. And he came to Ghana to do some progress here. So the ministers have to be business-minded. Because tourism is business. You see, it is not about partisan politics. Tourism is big business. It's the fourth uh, foreign exchange earner for this country. So it's business. So anybody who gets in there, the minister and <coughs> head deputies, should be thinking business at all times. So when we have got that done, then you can know who and where to go to get the kind of support that you need to you know, bring the money out of the, 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 the sites or whatever, the spots that we have. But that's not what we are seeing. The ministers have challenges because the attitude of the Ghanaian has not come to a point where we, we appreciate tourism as something that we should all support to bring the kind of revenue that you know, the country deserves. We speak about Nkofu and it's because of uh, this Ghana, Ghana 60 years on. That place where Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was born, for me, is so huge that anybody who has touched it as a leader and has messed it up should, should be called to question. Because you go to George Washington, uh, where whatever in America, and the place is sharp. You understand? And I was using the example of GBC. If you should come to GBC and people are just coming to tour, GBC can have a very neat canteen where people will spend money. You don't have to charge them to get in. But they're spending. So tourism is also about spending. Mm -hmm. But how can I go to Ngofu to spend? When the place, I don't even have a, 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 a if I eat, excuse me, if, when, if I eat, where am I going to empty 
<laughs> whatever. It's, you don't have a decent place. So these are the fine, fine, fine things that we ignore that, as uh, Kofi said, mess up the whole process of developing the tourism uh, industry. We ignore the small, 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 small things. You go to Wuli Waterfall. Is there a, a, it was just recently that uh, in Zulezu had a, 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 a washroom Washing. facility. Mm. How long has Inzulezu been around? I was there and I've been there. You understand? So this whole business of tourism, and I keep using, you know, your, your home. If your home is so comfortable that as, as a minister or as a journalist, you can wake up and have a good bath, you can have a good wash, you can have... If you go to a hotel or if you go to a tourism, why should that be denied you? You understand? So when we're able to identify all these little, little things, then we train the individuals, you know, because if you pick, if you go to a site and you take a waiter, does the waiter know what, what is waiting? You have to literally beg. You go to a, a, a restaurant and sometimes you have to be a regular to get a good service because you, they see Kofi coming there every day. So as soon as he enters, the waiters know him. So they rush to him and give him more the service. Then I'll be sitting there. I'll, you won't get repeat visits. And the person's white. Exactly. <laughs> and interestingly, he's made a very, very sensitive <laughs> point. You go to all the tourist sites in Africa, I'm not talking about Ghana, and the white people, you know, dominate. Because they understand tourism. They put money aside to relax. And people are forgetting. Tourism has a very, very, very big effect even on our health. Because you go and interact with nature. And nature has some way, some therapeutic way to, you know, refresh you and make you healthier. So they understand all those things. That's why the Ministry of Information and, and the PROs in all the, 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 the tourism uh, agencies should be understanding these things so that they put it in the mind of Ghanaians. That tourism is not just about going to drink and eat and sleep. You go there to relax. Mm. You should have a moment, maybe a day, two or three, to just get away from all your work. Just look at the sea. You know, God has put in something that I cannot, I, I mean, <laughs> describe. Something talks to you in a way, you, you enter Wuli waterfalls and the sound of the waterfall and the, and the hisses and the, and the hisses, whatever, <laughs> there's some sound. Kofi, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and as soon as you enter, you feel, you know. It's a sentimental attachment. You know what I mean? You get out of there and you're excited. But if you go to the place and the place is filthy, the place is, well, I mean. So if you ask me, these are the business things that we should be looking at it. And we should take it seriously. Right, we should take it seriously. The number to call is 0501-552-729 to get interactive with us. The number again is 0501-552-729. Alfred, mm, yeah. well, um, le let me come to you. You, you went to Unglofla. What, what do you foresee as the solid base of expanding our tourism sector with your, the, the story you, we just watched? in perspective uh, well I, I don't know the story was but as i was coming i was monitoring it oh that it's about the hometown of um dr kwame nkuma okay have that a that was yeah. but we did go to ngulof floor okay too. the indigenous or the locals call it ngulof floor but we know it as ngulof floor okay and uh, the first uh, i mean clip that we watched was half a sini Okay, that was so, so what do you, what do you foresee as a solid yeah. piece of expanding tourism across the country? Uh, well, I, like he rightly put it, um, tourism is supposed to be a business and we need to invest in if we need to really, I mean, get the returns, the necessary returns. I mean, all of us here on this round table have probably traveled outside the country before and we know the kind of benefits that countries have derived. I heard you talk about George Washington, but I would like you to talk about um, Vladimir L. H. Lenin, um, where he was buried. It's not just a tourist attraction, but it's now a shrine where people go to worship. So it even goes beyond the physical attachment. It has something to do with the sentimental attachment. I don't know how it, where it comes from or where it is derived, the source. But it is something which is aesthetic. It is something that is very mystical. When you go there, sometimes goose pimples will bathe you. If you go to Israel and you go to uh, Bethlehem, which is now unfortunately, unfortunately, in the lands of the Palestinians, right? The Palestinians who are predominantly Muslims are now deriving a lot of benefits from a Christian leader. Mm -hmm. And you can 
can you can just imagine the number of people who troop to Bethlehem once in a day on Golgotha in Jerusalem where Jesus Christ was buried the same thing happens I mean an unending pilgrimage of Christians trooping to one place uh, by the size of an Olympic size stadium right and I was there and you can realize the kind of religiosity which is exhibited at that point by the end of the day you can just imagine the amount in dollars that is accrued to that particular country within a space of a day or a year so I um, mean that is the my perspectives mm -hmm. but you see it is very sad and pathetic to go to such places like Engrofro the birthplace of Kwame Nkrumah, who is not just a Ghanaian, but an international icon, to be there for two hours doing your report, and no single person, whether local or foreign, this is the place. Mm. But you go to the reception, the lady there, <laughs> I, 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 I'm at pains at saying this, but I need to say it for people to sit up. Excuse me, uh, what's your name? Could it be Mente Brofo. At the reception, <laughs> your case is you, 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 <laughs> you, you go met, there you met with a natural hair, <laughs> plaiting the hair with one right hand, twisting it. I don't know the hairstyle, and her hand fully dug into wache or some local type of food. Then he talks to you. He cannot speak the language that you want to speak to her. Then <laughs> so it's just a whole. It's very problematic. And I would not want to put the blame at the doorsteps of any other, but it's a collective responsibility. And we need to set up, if we really want to really recoup the kind of benefits that as a country we need, this would be my preliminary contribution to the uh, program. Mm. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Mr. Kobli, you want yeah, to say yeah, something? I just, I just want to uh, look at uh, participation in tourism. Mm. Uh, half the time we think of the foreigners, the foreign uh, sorry tourists. Sorry to catch you yeah. this way. I, I hear we have Joe Akolache mm -hmm. on the line. Hello, Mr. Akolache. Yes, madam. Good morning and good morning to your panelists. Good morning. Yeah, I think uh, the topic is very interesting. Thank you. But, uh, my program is uh, uh, we don't take tourism as, as, as serious as we should because uh, the, you can take a day to go to, to visit Ghana and leave. And uh, secondly, again, uh, secondly, again, the hotels are too expensive for tourism. And uh, our food, local food are too expensive more than foreign food also. So I think uh, a tourist coming here is like a waste of money. Because if you go to Thailand, it's where I live, I spend most of my time in. They have something called sex tourism, that people come from all over the world and go there just because of that. You understand? But here, if you want to come up with something good, like some time ago, I wanted to come up with uh, West Africa tourism um, <clears throat> no, festival. And I, I wrote a proposal to um, uh, how do you call it? AMA, yeah. AMA to accept me to organize West Africa tourism by bringing people from Liberia, Nigeria, all over Africa, West Africa to have a, a program on you know, the six March. That was 2005. I couldn't get a proposal for that. So tourism in Ghana, I know tourism make a lot of money, but let's, for instance, let's take it that everybody comes to Ghana with only $1,000. Mm. And we have about 1 million people. That's a lot of money for the economy. Uh, yes, because the hotels are too expensive for tourists and food especially our local food are very expensive too okay so point well, well made mr Palachi. right thank you so much for calling mr yeah. Kalachi, yes, uh, you 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 also do with the tourism um board right yes um, mm, he he's his concern is on the the high prices yeah, for hotels and our, our, our Ghanaian local food, are they that expensive as against the foreign foods, as he suggests? You see, tourism is a competitive business. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, We live in Ghana, so we might not realize that coming to Ghana and staying in Ghana is more expensive than staying in our neighboring countries. So when you deal with people from Cote d'Ivoire, you deal with people from Nigeria, they'll tell you food in Ghana is expensive. Mm -hmm. 
um, hotel accommodation he's very right it's quite expensive tariffs air tariffs expensive destination so that's one of the things that our new uh, minister must look at okay so it's easier and cheaper for someone flying from the UK to go to Gambia for instance or Mali or uh, Burkina Faso than to come to Ghana or even Benin now I would also want to add because external dimension that even when you have foreigners coming if before you, you talk about the yeah, external dimension yeah. <laughs> prince from kumasi yeah. welcome on the show uh, thank you madam okay and uh, greetings to your panelists over there yeah uh, as the man in the yellow uh, in africa where uh, was talking about uh, how uh, uh, we are usually talking about theoretical things without practical things we normally in Ghana we talk about uh, theory, theory things than practical things. And you give a work to a person and you talk, 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 talk. By the time you come and evaluate the work, nothing is done. And GBC, for instance, you use it as an example. I, normally, even your, your lineup of program is even boring to watch. You, 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 normally, you, normally, you normally showcase things outside than things in Ghana here. I don't know what you people are there to do. Like, okay. Example, as uh, as me right now, very beautiful. All right, thank you, Prince. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one on us. Uh, but please go <laughs> complete your. I like your, the way you're taking it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Criticism is good. Yeah. It helps you to yeah, yeah, set, up, yeah. set up right. Yeah, yeah. So even when you have foreigners coming in with their dollars, if the tourism setup is not well structured, these foreigners will come with the dollars, but they will leave with these dollars. Okay, because when I go to an attraction and all I can do is pay the gate fee and then there are no facilities there, there are no services there, there are no restaurants there which would engage me to patronize, I come back with my money back in my pockets. Um, the idea is that the attraction is just a hub. Around a tourist attraction, you should have services and businesses. You should have a souvenir market mm. where the person who has come all the way would say, okay, I've made it, I've been here, but I wish to take something away, something that will remind me years on that I was really here. Is it a t-shirt? Is it a craft item? Okay, so these are part of the grand design if you want to maximize from tourism. If there is a restaurant at a tourist attraction and I travel all the way, why would I not have my lunch there before I leave? But if there is no restaurant attached to that attraction, I'm in a hurry to leave because I'm hungry anyway. Okay, so if you watch, the number of days that tourists stay in a country speaks of how that destination is able to engage that tourist. Because the science is that the longer the person stays there, the more money the person spends. The shorter the person stays in the country, the less money they spend. So one of our strategies is to ensure that when a tourist comes, if the average day is, let's say, five days, we should maximize it so that the tourists can spend much more time in Ghana. And the reason why the tourist will spend much more time is when he has things to see, he has things to do. If you should travel all the way from Accra to Axim to see a tourist attraction, and then there is no other attraction within the vicinity. There is no activity. There is no hotel, for instance, where you can say, okay, I'm tired. Let me spend another night here. You're losing out. Wow. Right, we're really losing out. Let me, let me take a few messages in here. This one says, I bet to differ with your guest saying you have to be regular at a restaurant before you get um, a good service. The truth is the industry doesn't pay well. Hence, it's very difficult to get quality personnel to, to wait. <laughs> I think it's about the waiting. Um, yeah, That's why the three to five star hotels have better services because they pay better. Right. We have somebody on the line. I'll come back. Okay, you're from La Paz. Your name, sir. Yeah, 
I'm, I'm, I'm Bismarck. I'm calling from Lapa. Great. Let's hear you. Uh, okay, I, you know, I like what the other guy, the, the one of your family member was saying. I don't, I don't know his name, but he was just talking. He was, he was saying something about... Miss Mark, could you please lower talking. the volume on your set because it's giving us a feedback. Okay. Okay, you know, um, the, we, we, you know most, most of these companies in Ghana are owned by multinationals, right? And they, they, they earn a whole bunch of money. And at the end of the day, they take the money back into their countries and they grow their economy back in their home. And so we are beating the, the, the country of money. And we are here, the little thing we can, use, we can do to attract them is some of these things, things of historical importance, like the, the tourism we are talking about. So if we say that, if we say that we have to... Uh, 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 encourage the government, all stakeholders to come on board. No, it's, it's, it's common sense. It's common sense. We don't have to waste time. We don't have to, I mean, like what you guys said, we come on, we come on uh, 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 these platforms and then talk about these things. We don't, we don't, we don't need to, uh, 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 I'm not getting that, but we don't, we don't need, we don't need these things to happen. Right. So uh, this, yeah, this is a short thing. I, I okay, to thank I, you, I, Bismarck. I yeah, this one says, good morning, Ms. Ewa. Mr. Kumsin is very right. Um, the prices are too much. For instance, I sell smoke uh, for, for all gender, I, I think, uh, uh, Unisys, right? Yeah. And, and uh, Northern Kente. I buy them from source at a high price and hence have to sell it at huge prices, which makes it difficult uh, for people to purchase. Thanks. This is from Ngezi Clothing. Um, I think your, your submission is to our earlier segment where we were talking about the textile industry and the issues in there. This one says, great discussion. I think our leaders should make it a policy and stop importing all kinds of um, cloth into the country and de decrease the price of our locally manufactured print. Same here, um, talking about our textile industry. I'll come back to you shortly. This one says, good morning to you all. Uh, I'm very... Saddened about your topic, you're, uh, you're talking about the former president. Oh, no, we are not talking about former president, Mama. I'm sorry, that is not what we are discussing this morning. Uh, we are in the Heritage Month, and we are looking at promoting Made in Ghana and our tourism sector as well. So the whole month of March is dedicated for that. This one says, the cost of our local products are really costly for a, a mere Ghanaian to afford. Instead, we will prefer the less costly to save money. Still in reaction to revamping our, our textile industry. William, yes. you wanted to make a point and you wanted to... Oh, yes, wow. yeah, there's a story. William, I did. I did. William sorry, sorry, there's sorry. A... Prince is on the line. <laughs> Prince are here, Glow. <laughs> Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, if the name is not Ahiadro, the name is Ahiadro. Okay, Ahiadro. Yes. Good, thank you for the correction. Can we hear yeah. you, sir? Yes, uh, I'm really, really enjoying the program. Thank you. A very educative program, of course. But there are one or two issues I want to talk about. These people talk about hotel bills being expensive in this country. In this country. And uh, it's unfortunate. They don't know what actually going to raise. We talk about taxes. We talk about a whole lot of things. And at the end of the day, you realize that if you're not careful, you're going to lose. You see, they should take their time, come forward, go to the hoteliers, especially to find out why your rates are high. Look, let me tell you something. A 30-room hotel, at the end of the month, on pays between 10 to 15,000 bills to electricity. I'm only talking about electricity. I'm not talking about water. I'm not talking about salary. I'm not talking about all that to the district and municipal assembly. You know, if, if you want to talk about all those things, you realize that at the end of the day, hoteliers are not making anything at all. Or who are going to suffer? Is the employees and then even the owner, the proprietor? Is it so when people want to talk about things expensive, things expensive, they should take their time. 
to have a one hand on actually goes into that type of project. So this is a little or the small contribution I want to I can say it and say it and say it till the don't day. Okay. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, I just want to be brief on this matter. Right, thank you, Mr. Hiadro. <laughs> Okay, William, let's have your Yes, point. I was just coming to Mr. Hiadro's point. <laughs> you know, uh, seven years ago, there was this project that Togbi Akode, who was the boss of African Strategic uh, Securities, wanted to put up $1.56 billion project along the beachfront. Mm. And the story is here. He was so frustrated that he had to change the, the, the whole... Show, 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 show us know, the, this yeah. is This, is, this it, was published... Let's have it, yeah. This was published... You know, in the mirror. This is your story, yes, right? Yes, this is my story. Okay. I had an interview with him, and I was sad at the frustration that he went through. And what he had to do was to change the whole idea and then go for a building for World Trade Center. Oh. That's how can we have the World Trade Center today? Because it was supposed to be part of that project. And this is the, the artistic impress. This was supposed to be the World Trade Center. Mm. This one. So when you go to our beachfront, as we have been other parts of the world, you see a beautiful beachfront. But today, what do we see? Go behind the art center. You weep. So if people are talking about... Uh, okay. expensive hotels. It's because of some of these things. All right. So um, uh, we'll hold on to the expensive hotels and come back to it. <laughs> Ibrahim, Medina Social Welfare. Let's hear you. Okay. Hello. Hello, Ibrahim. Yeah, good morning. Hello. I'm really enjoying your show this afternoon because <laughs> you are talking about the Ghanaian business uh, structure. The way it's been done is very bad. When it comes to the fabric side and when it comes to the hotel side, they manage it as if they are not running businesses. They should know that they are running businesses. They are not doing things they are going to favor themselves. For instance, the Ghanaian uh, textile industry, they need to lower their prices. Because bringing goods from outside is cheaper and something which is being manufactured here is expensive. Why is this so? Why is this so? So they have to sit down, get a business plan. They know how to do certain things. All right, Ibrahim. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. Uh, thank you. Please, yes, uh, yeah. I was just rounding up on this. Uh, as the gentleman said, the hotel industry is suffering because there's no deliberate policy to support the, the, that sector. If you go to China, I was in China in 2007 and 2009. What the Chinese government was doing was that they had a contract with Miss Tourism Queen International mm -hmm. where there they were about 118 queens every year. And the, the, the number of people who follow them, journalists from around the world, about 300 journalists, including myself, we go, they give us free accommodation, knowing that at least each person out of the 500 or 1,000 people who come will have about 2,000 or $3,000 in their pockets. And you spend one month, you pay everything for you, thinking that it's free, but before you leave there, you would have spent. <laughs> so, yes, and they, they are still doing so. There's a deliberate effort on the part of the Chinese government want to open up the account. All they're asking from you as a journalist is to do your story and give them a copy. Whether it's negative or positive, they don't mind. So what has happened to our side? You know, so... Everything must be deliberate, and the execution, as I keep saying, must be clearly stated. Other right. than that, we'll go back and forth on the discussion, which will just become an academic exercise. Right. Isaac you know. Tete Oklu, from my here, let's hear you. We'll have you as our final caller. Okay. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. I really enjoyed the program, and um, our main problem we have is we devalue what we have. And we saw ourselves cheap. So when you saw yourself cheap and you devalue what you have, what will value what you have? No one will have time for you. Right, Isaac. <laughs> That's very yeah. brief and punchy. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, Alfred. Yeah. A solid point made there by uh, Mr. Siedu. Would you advocate for um, a private sector uh, collaboration? Or yeah. sort of in the tourism sector, especially um, with our focus in preserving our cultural heritage and archival sites. Uh, yes, I want to think along the same wavelength with him. I'm all over the world. I mean, best practices have shown that uh, there should be a PPP anytime. And by PPP, I don't mean any particular political party. <laughs> That's <laughs> private partnership. <laughs> in the way we do our things uh, because if the business sector at least booms and uh, as we always talk about the I mean uh, the private sector as the engine of growth then of course it's going to drive the industry and by the industry I mean the
tourism industry. Uh, if you go to most of the countries, we've all talked about Israel. I mean, you go to Galilee and look at the string of uh, beaches along that place from Jordan to Galilee. Even those who are expatriates that you travel with are just gap mouthed. They just look around. Everything is white, apart from the golden beaches and the uh, greenish foliage or fauna. You see that from Galilee to Jordan, everything is white. The chairs are white. The umbrellas there are white. The you don't have the kind of beaches he's talking about behind the art council, <laughs> where human beings and animals struggle for space to ease themselves. You see, so. <laughs> And the, the point is that most of the times when we talk about some of these issues, we look beyond ourselves and we try to maybe put the blame at the doorstep of governance or other people, right? But then if you're able to keep our environments very clean, our beaches, making sure that the environment itself is very clean, I mean, definitely it's one way of attracting. And we're raking some yeah, money. Raking was really? when the investors come, they also do their own checkups. They look at the way our culture is, the way our environment is, the way we behave, our behavioral patterns and other things before they really set up. So if we as a people do not appreciate this aesthetic things, how much more can we even drive it to the extent of inviting other people to come in? So it's a business, and uh, every business has certain professionals who know the ins and the outs. They are into the sector. We are journalists. We are pen pushers. So what we see is what we report on to bring it to the public domain and to the mindset of people to change attitudes and make sure that that kind of industry can be improved upon. So I think, I, I, I think alongside with him, and we need to push that agenda. Great. Finally, Mr. Kabli, yeah. what would you... Um, I would like would to link it directly to job creation. Um, when you have uh, people, Ghanaians, just Ghanaians, going out there, um, it directly creates business opportunities. Um, I, like I said, I was with CTFM in their recent heritage caravan across eight regions for seven days. Uh, now, can you imagine what happens when... 100 people are stopping at Bamboy to have lunch. 100 people are having breakfast in Tamale. 100 people from Accra are having uh, uh, dinner in, let's say, Busia Beach. That brings a lot of business directly and indirectly to the farmer, to the fisherman, to the hotelier. You understand? So if we should decide that let Ghanaians go out there, let them tour their own country, let them see their own country. The wealth itself is redistributed. And then there's also the angle of urban rural migration or rural urban migration. If the area, the neighborhood is active with tourism activities, young people will be engaged in terms of employment. And, and the <coughs> tendency to come all the way to Accra will reduce. So for me, the business proposition is too big to be ignored. Mm. Let Ghanaians go out there, let them see their own country, whatever it takes uh, for this new vision, for this new direction to achieve that, they should. Great. William, I know you would want to say something, <laughs> uh, but my time is up. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I've been permitted to give you a, a, a minute. One second. Okay, Actually, one second, right. I believe in charity. And I have to prove a charity beginning at home. And my, my, my attachment is to GBC. I want GBC to develop GBC as a tourist attraction because it is a heritage too. So that when I come here, I, maybe even from here, you can take me on tour of GBC and I'll see that I can buy some souvenirs, you know, some old uh, reporters and newscasters t shirts. I, can, I want to buy a t shirt with maybe uh, those old, mm. you know, on, on the front. I've forgotten their names, but if I see, I can recognize them. So, so just as, as if it starts here, then it, it will go on. So GBC, let's do something together. I think it is a very, <laughs> it's a very solid point you well, have maybe. raised, and and I concur. I, oh, that's uh, is that a consultancy? <laughs> <laughs> this is free consultation, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, that is how we will wrap up of this show. Um, 
Uh, the program was sponsored by ATL, bringing fabrics to life, and was neatly um, staged by Ashrifia Wear in Adentan. And today we have been focusing on Made in Ghana goods, promoting our own, wearing our own, eating our own, and also projecting what we have as a people so that it can rake in the needed funds. We touched on the um, textile industry, and our final bit was on the tourism sector. And I have been in here with Mr. Kofi Akpabli. He is a Ghanaian academic journalist, publisher, consultant, everything. He's an award-winning um, Ghanaian journalist with an international touch. And uh, William Esiedo is also the managing editor for the Daily Heritage. He is an art writer and an award-winning Ghanaian uh, journalist as well. He's traveled all over. Alfred Hughes is also a broadcast journalist here with Radio Ghana. He, he has his, his stronghold as in feature writing and documentaries. That one I can put my head on the line for him. My name is Rebecca Ewa, and thank you so much, you out there, for joining us in the conversation by sending your test and your uh, calling us on the phone lines. We appreciate you so much. We'll meet you again same time next week. Bye for now. When night falls and the city lights are shown bright, with the country entirely asleep, then the work of the journalist begin. Our imagination goes wild, dreaming, thinking, and searching for that unique story idea. Visualizing and translating these ideas into action brings the story to life. And like the fizz in our wine glasses, the story bubbles, finding space as headlines on front pages in the print, broadcast electronically, and posted on new media across the globe. And when it catches the attention of the powers that be, they act speedily.